I can't tell you how many times I've heard people say, I like Full Metal Jacket, but just the first half. It's not hard to understand why people have this opinion. The acting is some of the best you'll ever see, and Kubrick's directing is so subtle you actually feel like you're watching a documentary on marine training. The sad thing is, it is so good it actually hurts the rest of the movie. Audiences were so taken by the first 45 minutes that they missed what Kubrick was trying to do for the entire 116. I think the biggest reason why audiences check out after the Paris Island section is that the film does not follow the cliché three-act screenplay format. This break from Hollywood structure is what made audiences either hate or love Kubrick films. In Full Metal Jacket, instead of making one film with three acts, Kubrick made three short films with recurring characters. I believe this because of the specific use of fade-outs that are used to stop and start new parts of the film. Now you might be asking why Kubrick structured the film in this manner. He made it this way to show how the Vietnam War was incorrectly described to Americans and how it was actually fought in the field. Drill instructor Hartman describes the war to the new recruits as a face-to-face -face conflict between godless communism and America. If your killer instincts are not clean and strong, you will hesitate at the moment of proof. You will not kill. You will become dead, Marine. And then you will be in a world of shit. Because Marines are not allowed to die without permission. Hartman's old school style of battle rarely occurred in Vietnam. The Battle of Hue City was the rare exception to a mostly hit and run jungle war. When we're in Way, when we're in Way City, it's like a war, you know. Like what, what, what I thought, what I thought about a war, what I thought a war was supposed, you know, was supposed to be. Uh, there's the enemy, kill them. The opinion that American troops were not properly trained for battle in Vietnam appears in several American Vietnam War movies. Just a little. Don't drink too much. Look, I don't want you drinking anymore, all right? I don't want you cramping up. You're humping too much stuff, Troop. You don't need half that shit. Gardner, you're with me. Look, in case anything happens to you, you get lost or separated, don't yell out, OK? OK. Just sit tight, and we'll get you. All right. As long as our officers and troops perform tours of duty limited to one year, they will remain dilettantes in war and tourists in Vietnam. 
As long as cold beer, hot food, rock and roll, and all the other amenities remain the expected norm, our conduct of the war will gain only impotence. We need fewer men and better if they were committed. This war could be won with a fourth of our present force. This is a major reason why America lost. New troops would have to be trained all over again on how to fight when they arrived. And by the time experienced vets understood how to fight, they would either be killed or rotate back home. You need leadership continuity from the top down to execute a military strategy. Without this, you will just go around in circles and never progress. As I pointed out in another Kubrick review, there was a propaganda war being fought along with the physical one. Stories were manipulated in order to show American progress in Vietnam, even when it was a stalemate. This false confidence was rampant from the bottom up, from the lowest field reporter to the president. If a nation cannot be honest about the facts of war, then they cannot conduct the war properly, and they can never win it. Perhaps the biggest factor in turning a war into a quagmire is the lack of a clear enemy. Without a clear enemy, the entire civilian population gets lumped in with your attackers. Anyone who runs is a VC! Anyone who stands still is a well-disciplined VC! <laughs> well, the ones I'm, I'm fighting at are some pretty pretty bad boys. I'm not real, uh, I'm not real keen on some of these fellows that are supposedly on our side. I keep meeting them coming the other way. Yeah. Well, if you ask me, uh, we're shooting the wrong gooks. Without an obvious enemy, you are almost destined to commit atrocity and fail to gain any ground. Within the three separate chapters, Kubrick hid several juxtapositional scenes for the viewer to discover. If your killer instincts are not clean and strong, you will hesitate at the moment of truth. You will not kill. You will become dead, Marine. Our last night on the island, I draw fire watch. And Joker, where's the weenie? Sir? The kill, Joker, the kill. I mean, all that fire, the grunts must have hit something. Didn't see him. Joker, I've told you we run two basic stories here. Grunts who give half their pay to buy gooks, toothbrushes, and deodorants. Winning of hearts and minds, okay? And combat action that results in a kill. Winning the war. Now, you must have seen blood trails. Drag marks. It was raining, sir. Well, that's why God passed the law of probability. Now, rewrite it and give it a happy ending. Say, uh, one killed. Go on. Waster. This is my rifle. There are many like it, but this one is mine. My rifle is my best friend. It is my life. I must master it as I must master my life. Without me, my rifle is useless. Without my rifle, I am useless. I must fire my rifle true. I must shoot straighter than my enemy who is trying to kill me. I must shoot him before he shoots me. I will. Before God, I swear this creed. My rifle and myself are defenders of my country. We are the masters of our enemy. We are the saviors of my life. So be it until there is no enemy. But peace. Amen.
There is one last point that I would like to discuss about Full Metal Jacket, and that is the casualty of youth. In war, the biggest casualties are the civilian populations, mainly women and children. Kubrick showed this in the symbolic childlike pile and the literal child sniper. But after watching the film several times, I noticed a very strange family relationship developed between Hartman, Pyle, and Joker. Hartman projects the masculine father role of a family, while he forces Joker to take the feminine mother role in raising Pyle. Private Pyle! Sir, Private Pyle reporting his orders, sir! Private Pyle, from now on, Private Joker is your new squad leader, and you will bunk with him! He'll teach you everything! He'll teach you how to pee! Sir, yes, sir! The left one, or the right. That one over the left. Left one over the right. The right one over the left. Fold the blanket and the sheet back together. Make a four inch fold. Okay? Got it? You do it. I'm trying to help you, Leonard. I'm really trying. Tuck your shirt in. It is even pointed out by Hartman that Pyle is a broken child of bad parents. What is your major malfunction, numbnuts? Didn't mommy and daddy show you enough attention when you were a child? <laughs> This shows why Pyle spared Joker's life. He was willing to kill the father, but he couldn't kill the mother. Thanks for watching.